I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, continuing analysis of Donald Trump's visit to the Middle East, and more specifically, his attempts to kickstart the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. Coming up at the beginning of June, as JBS celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Six-Day War of 1967, we'll be joined by a wonderful panel to recall the harrowing days that led up to Israel's remarkable and stunning victory over the combined Arab forces of Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq and Pakistan. And you'll be able to hear and see that roundtable on Monday, June 5th, which marked the day Israel launched its preemptive strike some 50 years ago. But after our panel had reminisced about their own feelings and emotions that they felt some 50 years ago, and after discussing the lasting implications and complications that have flowed out of the Six-Day War, the panel shared a moment talking about President Trump's suggestion that he could be the president who finally does achieve at least a modicum of peaceful coexistence between Israel and the Palestinians. We'd like you to hear what our panelists had to say. They included the National Director Emeritus of the Anti-Defamation League, Abe Foxman, who currently is the director of the Study for Anti-Semitism at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Thane Rosenbaum, Distinguished Fellow at NYU Law School, the director of the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society, and an award-winning essayist and novelist. Rabbi Eric Yaffe, President Emeritus of the Union for Reform Judaism, and a columnist whose op-eds appear in the Huffington Post, Haaretz, and many other Jewish publications. And you can read Eric online at ericyaffe.com. And Betty Ehrenberg, the Executive Director of the World Jewish Congress in North America. And we pick up the discussion as Abe Foxman explains why he feels Donald Trump may be in a unique position to jumpstart the peace process. The unreal can happen. The circumstances in the region are different than they have been in any other time. Khartoum time, 73 times. And it may be that you need a bulldog to bring them together to the point that the miracle is the devil made me do it. I didn't want to do it, he didn't want to do it, she didn't want to do it, but listen, this guy, so you know what? Uh, and again, you're talking about 67, if we didn't have all these things in place, less chance of it happening. So I'm, I'm an optimist. Do you think there's any chance that Donald Trump can make peace between the Palestinians and Israelis? I tend to be more pessimistic about that, but if it happens, I'd probably say it is a miracle. Any chance? I, I told Abe, I my last article for Aritz uh, was entitled, Give Craziness a Chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suggested, yes, he's crazy. But maybe what we need is a bulldozer and a bully, and maybe he can do what nobody else has done. The chances are slight not impossible, and if he can do it, I will support him. Well, I'm not sure that Abbas and Netanyahu are the best players for this, but I did work on the Jeb Bush campaign, as you know, and I, you know, you, it's impossible to have worked through that campaign to have seen how extraordinary what Trump did, so unimaginable that maybe, I, you know, it's impossible to count him out. Boy, I don't understand four of you. This is not about land, it's not about borders, it's about an existential reality that the Palestinian lives with and he has the right to that existential reality and the existential reality is the land is his. And yeah, sure, the Jew is willing to share it because the Jew is the, just not his land, that's the Palestinian answer. Palestinian says it's not, it's, it's not about Ramallah, it's not about so you don't Ariel. believe people can change, can have I, vision I, and dreams, and dream about it? We have 2,000 want, years for Jerusalem. I want to see any evidence. It's not about, not about who the peacemaker is. I want to see one piece of evidence that suggests to you 
that a bus wants to change, could change, and could could change and live a day. I don't think it's all about a bus. I think there are other there are other forces, other powers who can make it happen. Tell me what powers are. Tell me what the powers are in the Palestinian Those world. who have common interests now to fight another war. Another war, so, not the Israeli war. Okay, so war. I want to make sure everybody's this. Abe Foxman is saying it's not a boss who will make peace. Correct. It, and it's not and it's not about Trump. It's about what the Arab League Absolutely. saying to the Palestinians it's over. Right, because they supported there was a time, there was a time where the Arab League held the Palestinian issue. They gave it over to Arafat. Then they came to Arafat many years later and said we want it back, and he said, No way, no how. I think that the, 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 the whole political situation of Shia and Sunni self-interest are so that this is not an issue They're that scared. many of them can afford to permit to undermine their biggest struggle. They have a very serious struggle. Their existence. Okay, poet, I want to make sure you understand. So what you're saying is the Arab League's interest right now is so that they will stop incitement and murder of Palestine, by Palestinians against Jews. We will see on PA television, we won't see any more that Jews are the descendants of pigs and apes, and three-year-old children will not be taught how to stab Israelis. You're saying to me that the, that the Arab League the it will be successful in I, stopping that from happening. Uh, Mark, I am saying that the Arab League can say to Abu Mazen, from here on in, we will negotiate the future of the Palestinian people, etc. Because we support you politically, economically, militarily, etc. Now you're talking about a detail. Yeah, if a he detail? no longer controls yes. the radio airwaves and TV, yeah, they can't change it. Um, they're not going to turn around tomorrow and educate love and peace. They have to stop incitement. That's a lot easier. They have arrested uh, imams in their countries who, who preach against them. Okay, so they know how to do it. They certainly can do it in Ramallah. And Hamas is going to stand by and say, fine. Well, not everything is, listen. But Hamas here, has to listen, agree or it doesn't work. Listen, here's the President of the United States who came into to Saudi Arabia, condemned Hamas and Hezbollah. Okay, and no revolution happened. It, good for him, by the way, right? Right. Good for Trump. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But the that's Arab, different than saying enemy that the Iran. Arab League is going to be able to, uh, to convince Fatah and Hamas, because the Arab League says you'll make peace now. You know, convincing, that you will give up. There are many ways a, of convincing. An Islamic jihadist <laughs> desire to see all of that land under Muslim control. You know what? They've already changed their language. They play all kinds of games. There is a reality world. Okay, but I'll make sure. Everybody, I hope you're right. I'm Me not too. rooting for you to be wrong. Okay. I am skeptical. But I'm not rooting. And you want to say? I agree with him. And you say? Look, you're... He'd like you're, to you're, agree what, with what, you. What, what, one other word. <laughs> Iran. Iran. We're talking about Iran. Iran. Right. The Saudis and the Arab League are scared to death of Iran. For them, that's an existential issue. They're more than happy if, if, if the conditions are right and if, if, if Trump plays his cards right to impose their will if that's what's required to have America. Except that and they, they don't... Know how. But they don't have a lot of sway over the Palestinians. They're not the ones that are financing the Palestinians now. The Europeans are financing the Palestinians and others. So that how much the Arab League can force on the Palestinians at this moment you think is in question. The Europeans question. are going to prevent a, a, a you know a, a peace? peace agreement. Right. I don't know that the Europeans. European, Europeans will defer. You know, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. No, but the They're question is going back to French Mark's conference. point, which is. Do the Europeans then have any kind of leverage in the payments that they make to the Palestinian Authority? They can remove the negative. Right? Where they, where, I mean, Mark's point is essentially, look, if you do the polling, 70% of the Palestinians believe in a one-state solution, and they keep chanting songs from the river to the sea, and they keep holding on to keys for land that exists in Haifa and Tel Aviv. What are you going to do about those 70%? Does Donald Trump 70 have 70% of the Palestinians? 
70% of the Palestinians believe in a one-state solution. Not, not that's true. That's not true. Not I, true. I, don't, I don't know All what right. surveys you're reading. Well, I mean, it not just true. isn't true. Not true. Gentlemen, really? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we're on television now. I don't want to embarrass you. 70% uh, depends who takes the poll. I, I, I want to suggest this, that there, there are other polls uh, yeah. uh, suggesting well, much I've more favorable I've been here long numbers. enough to know everybody has their own poll. Right. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, so I won't go you with polls. You don't come at me with polls. We're all set. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, I, I hope you're right. I think what you're missing is the extent to which the Arab world is hostage to an ideology they cannot give up. And if you're saying to me that uh, Donald Trump somehow is going to leverage the fact that Saudi Arabia needs American support in its fight against ISIS and its concern about Iran, that it will be able to get Saudi Arabia and the Arab League to tell the Palestinians they have no choice but to make peace with Israel. While I pray you're right, it is inconceivable to me, and I feel to myself, you are, you are, you, you are an idealist and a romantic yeah, that, that's and, Abe. Abe's often I, called an <laughs> ideal. <laughs> it is inconceivable, that? if you will, <laughs> the President of the United States, by the name of Donald J. Trump, to address 50 leaders of the Arab world in Riyadh in the language that he addressed them. He gets away with it. It is inconceivable for what you and I know, the level of relationships that exist today between Arab states and Israel, not because of ideology, but because of self-interest. Interest dictates so much of what goes on in the world. And for many years, the Palestinian issue served the interest of all these countries. Every time they had a problem, a tzara, a headache, they would reunite on the Palestinians. They would say it's because of that. And everybody knew that it's Gornish. Now, it took 9-11, and it took all the events afterwards, and the Arab Spring, winter, whatever, to convince the world that it was nonsense. And we Americans would say, the last president said that America's national security interest, number one, was the establishment of, the Arab, you know, of a Palestinian state. We were feeding this. It's no longer there. The only one who's still feeding it is King Abdullah of Jordan, who came here and said this is a number one. Everybody else in the world, including the Arab world, knows this is not the issue. They have another issue. Very, very serious. It impacts on their existence, on their faith, on their freedoms, etc. And all of a sudden, this is just a, a gorgeous. And I believe, therefore, self-interest, not love. People, I thought you were going to say, the enemy of your enemy is a friend everywhere in the world, but not necessarily in the Middle East. But the interests are holding. The interest, look at the words that Donald Trump used in Riyadh. Four years ago, eight years ago, nobody What were the words? That. He said he's going to Jerusalem, he's going to the Jewish people, he hopes to make peace you know, between Muslims, Jews. That, that, you know, that language in Riyadh, his daughter speaking <laughs> to, to a group. So things are changing. I am a pessimistic optimist, yes. but I am an optimist. Is he convincing you? It's pretty good, you know. <laughs> Stop there. <laughs> a little no. bit, a little bit, a little bit. Look. Maybe he's right. I think he's right about the changing circumstances and the attitudes in the Arab world that he's absolutely right about. The reality of, of I Iran and ISIS and all of that upheaval constituting the existential threat to them, no doubt. Whether it can change around... Uh, um, the antagonism towards Israel, I don't know. Uh, on, the on the part of the Palestinians, I don't know if that can become, uh, be changed. And I do worry about a forced peace and an imposed peace. I don't, we, all, we always talk about a genuine and a lasting peace. I don't know if an imposed peace can be genuine and lasting. Um, maybe out of practicality, I think Abe is suggesting that it could be done because it's, it's practical now and serves 
their interests. I'm wondering if still an imposed peace on the Palestinians would yield a genuine and lasting. Has he, has he inf influenced you a little bit? The X factor is can a bullying President Trump bully the Palestinian street? I mean, that's the X factor. You know, we're, we're starting to see a whole different way, an, an undiplomatic. Why do, you, why do you have to use the word bully? It has such a negative overtone. No, it is the tone. Why, why, it's why the tone. Why don't it's you the, say a it's persuasive the tone, It's the Donald tone of, Trump. because it's the tone of this administration. Little Marco, does anyone it's, remember it's that? The this is the tone, it's the it. tone of this administration. I didn't set the well, tone. Well, nothing here. he said in Riyadh sounds to me as if he's a bully. Well, I, I think if you're sitting in Riyadh <laughs> and listening to this, you've never heard a president speak this way, and it does sound a kind of, uh, it has an aggressive tone. It was really? an aggressive it was, tone. They the loved it. Was not, and they may have loved aggressive. it, but they, they had. It wasn't aggressive. All right, they, so let me give you. Uh, maybe, what would you have somebody ever say? But I think that they were surprised by what they heard. He did yeah. say, I'm not lecturing you, which is great. But he did give them, he was reading them the right. He proceeded to lecture them a little bit. <laughs> oh, have you changed, so let me your, give you, are you have you changed your feeling about Donald Trump? Have I changed But oh, that's my, not a fair question because we don't know what your feeling was. Right. What I should say better is for all of Donald Trump's deficiencies, whatever they might be, do you feel that he could make a positive contribution to the world and the Jewish people? Yes. Because of this? Yes. I mean, I don't hold against him who he is, what he is. Yeah, he's in a position today that he may possibly bring about his historic changes. I think he's right. Would you feel that he's, way about He, he wrote the piece it? on whatever, that. Whatever the problem <laughs> Donald Trump has, I wrote, you'd I, be thrilled if he could be. I, 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 I wrote a piece. I made, I made many of these arguments. I'm delighted to, <laughs> to hear uh, uh, Abe talking about it. Look, ultimately, what I said, does he have the attention span? You know, does, does he have the character and, you know, the administrative structure in his own government that even if he wants to do it, that would enable him to do it? He listened, to two two rabbis. Rabbis. Yes, he he listened today yes. to two rabbis explain the history of the Kotel, which I thought he wasn't going to be. But let me give you a final, you see, of change. Ten years ago, uh, I took an ADL delegation to Saudi Arabia. We finished our mission. We were going to... Israel, in Jerusalem. Prince Bandar offered his plane to take us. And, okay, we're going. And we begin this discussion and negotiation. Take us to, take us to a lot. He says, no, you have to go to Aqaba. And at the end of the day, the reason was that the air controllers in Riyadh were not talking to the air controllers in a lot but they were talking to the air controllers in Aqaba. Not very big, not very dramatic. The air controllers in Saudi Arabia talked to the air controllers in Ben Gurion in order to be able to land Trump's plane. Not a big thing, but on the other hand, a major thing. Because if they can talk on this, all of a sudden you can have it. So yeah, I'm an optimist. First direct flight ever. Right. First direct flight. We could have been the first direct flight. Saudi Arabia to yep. Israel. Israel. But it took the permission of the air controllers to talk to each other. Impress you? No. <laughs> 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 Look, he, I'm not counting. He uh, wants a train. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not counting Trump out. I'm just saying I, I'm much more sympathetic to what you started us off with, which is I think the Palestinian street means business. And there hasn't been that much evidence of a willingness to accept the existence of a Jewish state. And that's something that, and again, I didn't mean bullying necessarily as being critical. I'm saying, here's a guy that wrote the art of the deal. And he knows that sometimes some negotiations probably require a heavy hand. And he might have to come in and lower the boom on these people, both sides. And I, 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 know, that, I know that a majority of the Israelis have been, would like to see a two-state solution. I don't think that's true on the Palestinian side. Mm -hmm. And you say? <sighs> Is I that don't what you know. say? Yes, I don't mm -hmm. know. Well, well, I think we do agree on one thing. It would be wonderful. It would be extraordinary. And it would be a miracle sort of on the magnitude of the Six-Day War. Yeah. All right? And from the political sense, yes. All right. Fabulous. Thank you all very, very, very much.
the thoughts of Abe Foxman, Thane Rosenbaum, Eric Yaffe, and Betty Ehrenberg discussing the possibilities for peace between Israel and the Palestinians with the help of Donald Trump. And I find the balance between idealism and realism to really be highlighted in this discussion of a peace agreement between Israel's and the, Israel and the Palestinians at this point in time. If you watch JBS regularly, you've heard me say repeatedly, philosophically, I favor a two-state solution in which Israel and the Palestinians share the land, living side by side in peace like Canada lives alongside the United States, which is Brett Stevens' analogy. And I support a two-state solution because that's what the Jewish people have supported since 1937 when the Peel Commission recommended partition as the only way to have peace between the Arabs and the Jews, each of whom believe the land of Palestine belonged to them historically. Whatever one may think of this Israeli policy or that Israeli policy, it is painfully clear the Jewish people and the state of Israel have been willing for 80 years to share the land in a two-state solution. That's not new. And for 80 years, the Arab world and the Palestinian world today has answered also, without equivocation, over my dead body. So I ask myself now, what has Mahmoud Abbas done that suggests to me he truly wants a new era of peaceful coexistence with Israel? The realist in me tells me there's nothing to suggest a change in the thinking of Palestinian leadership and really of the Palestinian people. The existential reality for the Palestinian is that the infidel has no right to sovereignty on any piece of Palestine, especially the Jewish infidel. That's why the Palestinian chant and those who support the ignominious Palestinian cause is from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. This is a core belief in the Palestinian world. And Palestinian leadership has done nothing, nothing to indicate any change at all. If the Palestinians laid down their arms today, there'd be peace with Israel tomorrow. Does anyone seriously doubt that? If Israel laid down its arms today, there'd be no Israel tomorrow. Does anyone seriously doubt that? And I don't say this because I want it to be true. It's not that I believe Palestinians are bad people, but Palestinians have their worldview. They're entitled to it, and they've been taught for generations. A religious philosophy predicated on certain principles, and one key principle is, once Islam has ruled a piece of this earth, that piece of earth belongs to the world of Islam forever. The Jew simply doesn't belong anywhere in Palestine. This is not a border dispute. It's never been about borders, about where the line should be drawn, the 67 line, which is really the 49 line. How many people, brilliant people, recognized scholars, from Bernard Lewis to Mordechai Kedar, including Palestinians who come on JBS all the time and say, tragically, this is Islamic philosophy taught in mosques everywhere in the world, including the United States. People come on JBS all the time and tell us. Every time the Jew says, we'll share the land, the Palestinian says, over my dead body. That's just being realistic. It's tragic, but that's the reality. 
and we can't wish it away. It's what it is. And that's the realist in me. And I know it's the realist in many of you. But our Jewish tradition also teaches realism should never abandon idealism. Jacob's ladder was firmly planted in the ground, but its top reached into the heavens. A Jew has always been a realistic optimist. And so I'm also moved by those who say, keep an open mind. Always keep the door open. And if the door appears to be open a crack, try to walk through it. Open it all the way. So the Jew, the Israeli, has responded to every possible opportunity, often to his disappointment. But so what? In the cause of peace, disappointment should be irrelevant. So I agree with those who argue, give Trump a chance. Maybe he's so unorthodox. He'll be able to convince Abbas and the Palestinian Authority, with the help of Arab nations who now seem to need Israel's help in their fight against Shia Muslim extremism, that it's finally the end to incitement. It's the end to murder. It's an end to the claim of a significant right of return. Maybe it's time for the Palestinians to formally and unequivocally recognize Israel as the legitimate nation state of the Jewish people with every right to live in Eretz Yisrael, the historic home of the Jewish people, as the Palestinians want to live in their state. But I would always insist that Donald Trump and any other person who believes a sea change in Palestinian thinking is possible, I insist that Donald Trump must demand that as a prerequisite for peace negotiations, the Palestinians must do something to prove their serious intentions, do something tangible that saves Israeli lives. And those are my thoughts. I'd love to hear yours. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to reading some of your comments on JBS at a later time. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.